This is the Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. So, you remember a few years back, it was that whole WWJD thing. I don't know if it's all that popular anymore. There was keychains and necklaces and bracelets. There was even bumper stickers, right? WWJD, what would Jesus do? Remember that? I mean, it was supposed to be a way for us to keep on track and to make us think, of what we imagined Jesus would do if he were in our shoes. We were supposed to, in every situation, stop and consider how Jesus would handle it if he were right here. Did it work? Hard to say. God bless you. <laughs> Did the campaign achieve what it set out to achieve? Again, hard to say. But today, it made me think about Pentecost. Now maybe that's a stretch, but I do like to stretch things. You all know that. And, so, and kind of the most popular stories that we hear about Pentecost, the one we just heard from Acts, for instance, you might find it difficult to associate that with the whole what would Jesus do thing. But not in John's Gospel. Pentecost and WWJD go hand in hand. In other Pentecost stories, right, we hear the Spirit coming and resting on your head like a tongue of flame. I get that. But John talks about the gifting of the Holy Spirit with well, a story about how we're going to do even greater things than Jesus does. Wow. Now that, there would be some that would say that a line of thinking that leads us to consider how we can do greater things that Jesus did would probably be not, not be a line of thinking that we ought to pursue. In this text, though, it is Jesus himself who's telling us to indeed pursue that line of thinking. What do you think you can do better than Jesus? I mean, the obvious answer for most of us is nothing. I mean, even my answer is like, oh, no, I can't do anything better than Jesus. But that's not what Jesus is telling us. Jesus is telling us that we can do all the things that he can do and more. And that is a huge pill to swallow. We don't like to think that way. We like to sit back and use that old WWJD thing to answer each problem and wait until Jesus shows up to do whatever it is that we would imagine him to do. Now maybe I'm being a bit cynical here. Maybe, but it's easy to see that happening in our world. 
we speak to it a bit in worship, right? We say, come Lord Jesus, or come Holy Spirit. We even say in our meal prayers, right? Come Lord Jesus, be our guest. We get that. And I'm not speaking against that. All I'm saying is that maybe Jesus is already here. If we really live into what Pentecost is all about, we have to say that the presence of Jesus is already here. We have to say the Holy Spirit is here and therefore Jesus is at least not very far away. And if we listen to the Gospel of John, it means that we can do all sorts of great things in Jesus' name. In fact, He tells us in the text, whatever you ask for in my name, I'll give it. Cool. I'm going to ask to win the lottery in Jesus' name. Yeah. So last night as I was giving this, my next thought in here, my next sentence is, I could ask for my favorite team to win in Jesus' name and it would happen. And the twin won! (laughs) What? Wow, that was great! An eight-game losing streak broken because I preached. All right, that's enough of that. I'm not, I, okay, I'm, just, I'm not going to keep going with that, right? That's not what Jesus is talking about here, people. It's just not, right? WWJD might come in handy, and I'm not sure that the point of Jesus' ministry and teaching that he did was to get us to the point where we can satisfy our own wants in his name, and he'll show up like some sort of genie, and it'll happen, right? I can rub my cross and ask for something, and Jesus will be here. There, there sure is plenty in Scripture that really ought to take you away from that line of thinking, right? It should turn you away from that. So if that said, what's the point? Well, I think my job here is to throw some ideas out at you and see what sticks, right? Think about WWJD, what would Jesus do, in a positive way. If we use this little reminder to think about Pentecost, then maybe it's useful. When we consider that we have been gifted with the presence of the Holy Spirit, that constant presence, the forever deal, then we can also consider what would happen if that Spirit took over in whatever situation presents itself. The Holy Spirit's here, so how would that Spirit, through us, handle it? There's plenty of times in Scripture where this comes to bear as well. Jesus handled much of what came up in a loving, compassionate, and caring manner. We know that. We see Jesus' love manifest itself in almost every situation that he faced. I mean, there was that one time in the temple, right, where, you know, he flipped over some tables and drove people out with whips made of cords and all that. I get that. And maybe that was necessary. And maybe it's even how Jesus was showing his love at that point. We'll move on. Even when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, when the Pharisees tried to trip him up, what's the greatest commandment? He talked about love conquering all and pretty much being the best thing that you can do. So as it turns out, that love is probably the answer to WWJD. What would Jesus do? Love. So if that's where we go with our line of logic, where do we go when we consider that Jesus tells us that we will do even greater things than he did? Can we really get to the point where we're thinking that we consider ourselves loving greater than Jesus did? Can we get to a line of thought that leads us to consider that? It sounds outrageous. It really does. But that might be exactly what Jesus is telling us in this text. We can indeed love greater than Jesus because Jesus is loving through us. And that means the love with which we approach each and every situation is the love of Jesus flowing through that Holy Spirit that is in each one of us. That love conquers all. It even conquers us. When we encounter the arrogance and the hate and the bullying and the condescension of the world, we can conquer that by using the love of Jesus that is in us because of Pentecost. If we have this kind of love inside of us, again, because of Pentecost, right? Then why are we not using it to its fullest? I don't want to seem like I'm being sour, but there seems to be a lack of love in the world today. Doesn't take long to see that on the news. Of course, maybe that's because bad news sells better than good. 
and this time I'm not going to apologize being cynical. I am indeed being cynical. However, I do think that the world has developed an ethic that teaches that it's better to define your success by the failure of another. Probably not the love that Jesus was talking about. The love of Jesus builds up. It does not tear down. If we followed the whole build up ethic instead, we would live in a world that celebrates diversity and the success of the other no matter what's happening in our little circle, right? We wouldn't use others to define us. We would define us. I know love overcomes all. I get that. I also get the answer to WWJD is love. I get that too. But there were other things Jesus did as well, weren't there? Jesus didn't keep silent when it came to calling people out when they weren't being the person that God intended them to be. The difference between us now and Jesus then is when, when he called them out, he did it in a way that ultimately built them up instead of shaming them into repentance. Now well, that happens in our world. I did a funeral this past week and I usually preach pretty close to the same message at funerals. I think I'm called to preach the light and the promise and all of that because people need to hear that. When somebody has died, they need to hear that they're Jesus promises us forever, right? So a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, he was from a way different state, several miles away, and he said, that was the best funeral I've ever been to. I went, wow, uh, that's kind of a strange thing to say, but okay, I said, tell me more. And he said, well, you preached about this promise and light in the darkness and eternity together and all that kind of stuff. He said, usually when I go to funerals, the guy says, this guy's time is over, and y'all better get your butt in church because you don't have much time left. Well, I said, I'm not, I don't preach that way. That's not the, I don't want to shame people into repentance. I wonder what it would look like in our world today if we used that love instead. Would it help our world to be a better place if we did not use the mistakes and misperceptions of others as a way to publicly shame them? Do we do that in order to make ourselves look better? Well, maybe. But again, that's not the Jesus way. In the world of youth, which is kind of where I function, I mean, I'm the youth guy here, so what are you going to do? One of the most popular methods of communication is social media. Right now, mo many of you might run to Facebook when I say that, but most kids aren't on Facebook anyway because it's full of adults. Okay. They're on Snapchat and Instagram and Tumblr. There's probably even more I don't know about, but I'm an old man. It is a beast. Social media can absolutely be a beast. Many times social media is used as a weapon and it is incessant. The banter can be never-ending. These kids can go to bed with a certain circle of friends and wake up in the morning, a social outcast. I'm not sure it's confined to, confined to the world of youth, but that's where I function. I've seen it happen, and it's devastating. Is that the love that Jesus was talking about? When faced with relationship difficulty like that, how would Jesus respond? I'm fairly certain Jesus wouldn't participate in the gossip that has become some sort of entertainment in our world today I'm just saying as I work through the different areas of our world that aren't quite unfolding the way that they should do I even dare go into the world of politics Ugh, probably not all I can say is that I think it's been a long time since any candidate has told us why we should vote for them and not against the other again the world works to tear down and define success by failure. As far as international relations go, there seems to be a fair amount of fear-driven discussions. Funny thing is, when Jesus shows up in our world, the, one of the first things he says to us is, don't be afraid. If we will do even greater things than Jesus, then we really shouldn't be afraid of anything. The whole idea of Pentecost is for us to set our sights and our vision on the Holy Spirit who is with us right now, here.
with the presence of the Holy Spirit comes the reassurance that we will be able to do all things through that presence and we should be unafraid and completely confident. We can be unafraid of anything that the world has to bring against us because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit and that presence will never leave. We can be confident that whatever God is calling us to do and wherever He is calling us to go, we can do and go because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit that will make all things possible and never leave us. I know I'm saying that a lot, but you've got to hear that. All of this is magnified as Jesus tells us that with Him, we can do even greater things than He did. That's not blasphemy. That's the promise that any situation that we are faced with and any task that presents itself, any relationship that develops, anything that the world throws at us, we can handle it. That we, when I say we can handle it, that we is us together with the constant presence of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, right? Philippians 4.13. Confirmation kids use that a lot. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Funny thing is, it doesn't say some things. It says all things. All. So today, celebrate that. And go forth with confidence and love. Amen.